Welcome to today's episode of the Losing Weight to Gain Control podcast. This is Gwen Alexander, your host. And today we have a guest with us. We have Robert J. Davis, PhD, and he's also known as the Healthy Skeptic. And he's an award-winning health journalist whose work has appeared on Time, CNN, PBS, WebMD, and in the Wall Street Journal. The author of three previous books on health, he hosts the Healthy Skeptic video series, which dissects the science behind popular health claims. Davis also holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree in public health from Embry University's Rollins School of Public Health, and a PhD in health policy from Brandeis University, where he was a Pew Foundation Fellow. So Robert, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Gwen. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, uh, we were talking before and I was mentioning about your book and how I really enjoyed it. It's just I think it's things that need to be said, and um, we need to get the the message out about what your book was about, that it's not just these quick fix things. It's, you know, there, there's all kind of different things to it, so there's no one size fits all. But I like the way you present it, and you also mention research in your book, so that's one thing I liked also. Well, thank you. Yeah, read, there's a lot of research in the book. I, I, I have a huge I'd say I went through uh, more than a thousand studies, uh, poured through those, and I have at the back there more than 300 citations. So I like to say most of us are not going to go look up the science, but it's there for people that are so inclined to go dig into the science more. Everything I say is uh, got a citation. So if people want to do that, have at it. Yes. So, um, and when we get started today, what I always like to start with is to have our guests share with us uh, what brought them to the point of where you wanted to help people in this area. You know, did you have as a kid where you would tease about your weight or anything that made you want to eventually say, I need to learn more about this? What's your story? Well, and, and, and you, in fact, mentioned something that is part of my story. When I was a kid, I was overweight as a kid when I was about six, seven, eight years old. And I remember, and I talk about this in the book, people saying things to me using terms like you have a spare tire and a uh, full seat and sort of euphemisms that even as a kid, I knew what they meant. And it really, even though I ended up uh, thinning out as I grew, um, it, it stuck with me because I've always felt, even though I, by any objective measure, I'm not overweight, I felt that I've continued to feel that way inside because of that experience I had as a kid. And so that's certainly one thing that's influenced my thinking about this subject and, and, and having at least some, a little understanding. And I can't begin to sort of say I completely uh, have the full understanding that somebody who's dealt with their entire lives, but certainly that small sliver of experience that I had as a child gives me some understanding uh, and, and the feelings, the residual feelings I have there. Um, also just, I have so many friends who have dealt with their weight, who struggle with their weight their entire lives, friends and family members and seeing what they've gone through. And that's something else um, I think that influenced me. And then also you mentioned I'm a journalist. That's, that's my, my professional work. And in my professional work, I try to look at various health claims around nutrition and fitness and all kinds of other wellness issues and really look at what's true, what's not true, and sort through fact and fiction. And I can't think of any subject where there's more conflicting, confusing uh, misinformation than there is around weight and weight control. And so that was another thing that sort of motivated me to really try to delve into this and help people um, who are trying to deal with this issue sort out what's true, what's not true. Yeah, one of the things I remember reading in your book was you used the words that people would say. When I was a kid, it was, boy, you're getting so big. They didn't mean all they meant yeah yeah uh, or at least I took it they meant the other way so it was kind of like when I when I see kids now I don't say oh you're getting so big I say wow you're getting so tall just because I don't want them to equate that miss you know Gwen thinks I'm getting big or fat or, so yeah words do matter in that area and they can and as you say they have lasting effects and as they did for me you know, I mean, people don't think about that particularly when they say things to children the kind of lasting effects they can have yeah, and one thing I also like that is you are a journalist, and journalists come at um, certain topics. Uh, they don't come at with, well, even if you have preconceptions, you want to present the information in a way that's here is the information. You make your decision on what's best at the time. Yes, and that's a very important point in, in terms of how I approach my work, not only with this book, but the other work I've done, which is my job is not to say, here's what you should do. My job is to lay out the information as fairly and thoroughly and objectively as I can and, and help people make better decisions for themselves, because what's right for me or what's right for you may not be right for somebody else. And so I see it as my role just to present the information and let, let people make decisions that are right for them 
based on informed uh, decisions. Yeah, and so let's get to, your book is about myth busting uh, and weight loss. So let's, can you give our listeners like the three biggest myths that we probably are given and why in the world do we believe them? Well, there's so many, but I'll just, you know, it's hard to list three, but three that I would say that certainly are important in terms of uh, the work that I've done is number one, this idea that there are specific villains that are responsible for our weight, whether it's fat or carbs or gluten or sugar or toxic foods, you name it. We hear this all the time. Um, and we, ha- we shift from one to the other. For a long time, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was fat. Fat makes you fat. And then it became carbs. And so we've had this sort of shift from one to the other and chasing after these different villains. And I think that's one of the biggest myths. In fact, uh, it's much more complicated than that. We can't boil down weight to one uh, specific food or category of foods. But often we see this, with, particularly with, with certain diets that fixate on a particular kind of food and say, if you'll cut out X, whatever it is, carbs, fat, sugar, whatever it is, then you'll lose weight. And, and people latch onto these kinds of diets because they tend to be simple and easy to understand. They may not be so easy to follow all the time, but they can at least be easy to understand. So that's one that we see all the time. Another is this idea that a weight management boils down to eat less, move more, E-L-M-M, as sometimes it's called. And I like to say that Elm Street, for many people, is a dead end because <laughs> it is just such an oversimplification, gross oversimplification of weight uh, of, of, or the biology of weight management that it just boils down to you just, well, if you just eat less and move more, you should lose weight. And so, so many people uh, try that and, and diligently follow that advice and find that over time that doesn't work for them. And we can talk about why, but they just, the, 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 the basic reasons there's, it's, it's so much more complicated. There's so many other factors, some of which are beyond our control. Um, and, and then that leads me actually to the third myth, which is that the idea that, every, that weight management is totally within our control. So that if we don't succeed, and then so many of us, most people try to lose weight and over time they gain weight back. Um, and if you don't succeed, it's your fault. That somehow you're not diligent enough, you haven't tried hard enough, you're lazy, you're gluttonous, whatever it is, that it's your, your fault. And this to me is perhaps the biggest, the most dangerous myth of all, because it leads to so many, uh, so, such psychological harm and physical harm too, but people believing that they're failures and and this kind of internalized stigma that happens, people blaming themselves and feeling like failures. And that can lead, studies show, to more unhealthy behaviors, um, eating that's not healthy and and not moving their bodies and that kind of thing. So it can have real uh, serious consequences, both both emotional and physical. And so, uh, in fact, people are not being told that, no, it's not your fault, that this is a complicated biological process. And just because you've tried this, in many cases, misleading advice and it hasn't worked, it's not your fault. And so I think uh, I would say that uh, that's another one. Now, in terms of your question about why it happens, the sort of very basic answer is money. Uh, as I talk about in the book, uh, weight loss is a, uh, an industry worth more than $60 billion annually in the US. And it's, even, it's, it, it's more than that now, that was several years ago. And you think of all the products that are out there, uh, foods, diets, uh, pills, Gym memberships, you know, join the gym and lose 30 pounds yeah. in 30 days, uh, supplements, all kinds of things that, that purport to help us lose weight. And all of, many of these things rest on the idea, on these myths, that if, if only you'll try this, if you try this kind of diet, if you'll do this, you'll lose weight. And if it doesn't work, try, keep trying, because obviously you didn't do the diet right, or you didn't, didn't follow the advice correctly. Um, so that's, I think, a big factor here that keeps us coming back. And the problem, of course, is many, if not most of these things don't work. So what happens? The, the purveyors of these, of these uh, various uh, remedies are all too happy to keep promoting them because what happens we keep coming back for more and spending more money and they make more money uh, because their remedies don't work. And so that's the, the kind of cycle that we see happening uh, over and over and over. Well, it's like you said, you didn't try hard enough or you know, this is your failing like you talked about with a third myth because I actually follow the obesity. Is it the obesity coalition online? And you know, I get their emails regularly and that's one of the things they're trying to fight is the stigma um, with being overweight or obese, it's not that they aren't trying, it's just, um, you know, there's so much, like you said, to it, it could be they're dealing with mental stuff that happened, either as a child or as an adult, that makes them want to eat, or they could have health problems, like I was diagnosed with lupus, and I have all kinds of other things uh, in 2017, so I was on steroids for a while, Do you know, you know what steroids does to somebody's body, but that sure. was the only thing they could give me to help me to function, and so that brought a lot of, you know, things I couldn't move as well. So 
so I've had to relearn how to exercise again. Uh, there's just, it's just what I call real life happens, you know, even if you, um, you do the things like they tell you to eat less, or was it eat less, move more? What happens right. when you can't move more because your body hurts so bad? Are you, you your joints and things? So, um, I mean, there's more to it than that, you know, concentrate on maybe on your foods at that time, but that doesn't mean you might get really small, but hey, you know, at least you're eating better. You hopefully will feel better or move what you can't do, what you can physically to exercise. You know, I ride my bike more um, now because my knees are as my, my knees will swell up. So uh, I rode almost five miles yesterday. I was proud of myself. I was like, hey, I did five miles. But, you know, some people might think that's not hard enough exercise. You, you need to be doing more, you know. Yeah, and, and it's a great point. And, uh, and unfortunately, this kind of these kinds of advice, pieces of advice we get don't begin to incorporate all of those nuances. Yeah, when you mentioned myth number two about the eat, was it eat less, move more? Uh, so should we ignore calories? Do they matter? Is that something we should take out of the equation altogether when we're trying to lose weight? Well, you know, when I like to say calories count, but counting calories often doesn't work. And that's just simply because um, it's very difficult to do precisely. You think about uh, even, even foods that you know the calorie count, you know, the box packaged foods, and there's a, there's a number on there, you know, 173 calories. You think, okay, I know I, I'm getting 173 calories. Even that's not accurate because under law, those numbers can be off by up to 20%. And often the calorie count is it's an undercount. So you're actually getting more, more often. Uh, than you think. So even, even and that's just foods we know the calorie count. Think about all the foods we eat. We don't know the calorie count. Whether you go to a restaurant and there's nothing on the menu, you go to someone's house, you cook at home, you go to a party, the list goes on. And yes, there are apps and calculators you can use to try to deconstruct the food, but that's far from accurate in terms of being able to determine really how many calories you had. And then the, the other side of that equation is how many calories you're burning and how many calories you need to burn to be in calorie deficit. And or an energy deficit, and that is equally hard. There are, again, apps you can use, but that's far from accurate because it's, it's very hard to calculate accurately how many calories you're burning and how many calories you need to burn. So if you can't know with precision how many calories you're actually taking in and how many calories you're burning or need to burn, then it's very hard to figure out exactly what you need to be doing to be in calorie deficit. So, so for that reason alone, just counting calories often doesn't work for people. And then on top of that, um, there are other factors besides calories that matter when it comes to how our bodies respond to what we eat. Um, for example, our genetics. We all know those people we hate. They can eat whatever they want and they never gain an ounce, right? And then there are other yeah. people that eat very little and they gain weight. And that's because our genetics differ. It varies from person to person how our bodies respond to a particular number of calories. So that is, a, is, is an influence. There's interesting research coming along and there's more and more all the time about our, the, the uh, microbes in our gut. Yeah. the so-called microbiome and how that affects our weight. Because, you know, it's not necessarily the number of calories we absorb, it's how we, we consume, it's how many that are absorbed in our gut that really matters. And so what research is finding is that varies from person to person, depending on the particular mix of microbes in your gut. And that can determine how many of the calories that you consume are actually absorbed. And the more you absorb, the more weight you're going to gain. So, so, so that matters as well. And then of course, it's our metabolisms play a role. Every, everybody's metabolic rate is different. And what happens is we uh, eat less and lose weight. Uh, in many cases, the metabolism slows down. It's sort of a, it's, it's, a, it's nature's gift uh, to keep us from wasting away in times of scarcity and famine, which is a wonderful thing if we lived in prehistoric times. But fortunately for most people today, it's not a problem, but it becomes a problem when we're trying to lose weight because essentially our bodies fight us, our biology fights us uh, by slowing down our metabolism. So that our how much your metabolism slows also affects uh, your weight. So the list goes on, but the point is that there are other factors besides calories that matter. And one other point I would make here is that when you fixate on calories, what it means often is you may end up making food choices that are not the healthiest choices. Yeah. So I may have a, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a snack and I, I have a choice between the jelly beans and the nuts and I'll say, well, the jelly beans have fewer calories if that's my major criterion and I'll eat the jelly beans. But in fact, the nuts, even though they have more calories are a better choice, they're more nutritious, they have fiber, uh, they have protein and they're more likely to fill you up uh, than the jelly beans. You eat those, you're gonna be hungry you know, 30 minutes later. So, 
Um, if you just look at calories, if you fixate on calories, you can end up making food choices that often are not the healthiest choices. So I think the, the, the point there is you want to look at cal calories as one factor, but not necessarily the only factor. You look at the overall quality of the food, um, you look at the fiber, you look at the protein, you look at the added sugar, and you look at how it makes you feel, whether it fills you up. And that's more important, I would say, than just fixating on the calories. Yeah, um, you mentioned about genetics. I have a half sister. We had we have different dads and her, the people on her dad's side, of the family are like really tall and skinnier. And guess what? She inherited that. So she would eat anything. And yeah. that just drove me. You know, I'm like, oh, great. You know, you're the one that can eat anything. And I inherited the genes from my mom's side where, I mean, we had to work hard, even on my dad's side, the family, the women, we have to work very hard to even get to what my sister looked like. And, you know, that would, as a child, that would play with your, well, with my brain too, that, you know, it's not fair. She, she doesn't have to work as hard as I do and she gets to eat whatever she wants. But I think sometimes people still use that as, well, you just still need to put in the work. You know, like you said, push away yeah. from the table, eat less with that. And also you mentioned about the restaurants. Uh, I notice a lot of them in my area are starting to put calorie information on the menus, but I always think, well, how accurate is that? Right. Who, who, who figured that out? You know, this is a huge portion they just gave me. Is this one serving? Is this two? Usually it's four. So, I mean, there's so many factors, like you said, that it, it's hard just to say that one thing is what you need to do to eat less. And I still hear, hear that a lot with some of the influencers on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook that uh, you're just not doing it right. You're just eating, still eating too much or the quality of food. That's a big thing over the years I've had to learn. Even today, I did that where I had some nuts to eat. And, I, and I, my brain was like, well, you know how many calories are in this, you know, this serving of nuts? I was like, yeah, but it's going to keep me full longer. And I'm not going to have that sugar crash later if I go eat this other thing that I'm thinking about. So even just that, after reading your book, I'm still, you know, in my mind trying to view uh, the foods I eat, not just in the terms of how many calories. Is this going to keep me under a calorie number for the day? So I thank you for that. Buy the book, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start talking about exercise, because I hear a lot of people still, like I said, they push exercise, exercise, and especially now with COVID, we're, what, two or three years after, are into it. And I'm noticing some people that uh, deal with long COVID are having like these autoimmune responses, kind of like what I have with lupus. And so one of the things I learned with lupus is I can't do those too many HIIT workouts. It actually taxed my body where I would get really tired, but I can do maybe lighter stuff or like lighter cardio, light weights. And, um, but the, the exercise illusion of that you have to go hard all the time or um, in your book, I think you talked about uh, the contemp compensatory response when it comes to exercise and our appetite. Um, can you explain that to our listeners? Sure. Uh, well, let me first say about exercise. You know, I'm a big proponent of exercise for health. I'm I, my last book, Fitter Fast was all about exercise. And I like to say, if it's the closest thing we have to a fountain of youth, if, if we could find a pill that everything exercise could do, everything from reducing the risk of heart disease and cancer to improving your mood to you name it, we'd all be clamoring for the pill. So that said, and again, I, I, I'm a big proponent of exercise. That said, the problem, the irony is that the, the, the thing that most of us often look exercise to do the most for us is that one thing it can't do very well is to help us lose weight. And so people as you say, we'll, we'll be told you got to exercise this whole part of eat less, move more, and particularly work hard, exercise harder, you know, do hit workouts, uh, run faster, do more, pedal harder, and you'll lose weight. And the problem is that the kind of exercise that most of us are willing or able to do or capable of doing because of limitations, like you're talking about, is simply just not going to uh, help us shed that many pounds. It's not going to burn that many calories. And that's just a biological fact. And also, it's true that as we if we are able to do vigorous exercise, the few of us who, the few people that can do that, run marathons or the sort of people who are, who are able to do that, um, at some point your body reaches a plateau and you stop uh, uh, burning more calories. So there's a limit to how many calories your body's going to burn. And that's in part because of this compensatory response. And uh, there are several fact, features of that, uh, one of which is that your body, your metabolism will slow down at some point to keep you same thing from dieting, doing a severe diet to keep you from wasting away because your body wants to stay in sort of energy balance. And so it, it, if it senses that you're exercising too much, it'll often the metabolism will slow down. Um, and then another thing is you mentioned is appetite. So in many people, 
as they if particularly you start exercising more and trying to exercise vigorously, appetite will increase. And so again, that's sort of the body's way of saying, okay, you need more energy. And so you need to consume more fuel because you're burning more calories. And so that's something that, that fights us there. So, so I think that um, that's a real problem, I think. And, and um, it's, it's a problem, I think, because exercise ends up becoming something very negative. Uh, and people find that they try to exercise to lose weight and it doesn't work for them. They bang their heads against the wall and say, okay, wh why bother to exercise? Because it's not working the way that it was promised. And, and I say that people go in with uh, sort of uh, the wrong expectations. They're told something that's not true. Instead of being told, uh, think of exercise as something that's going to enhance the quality of your life. That's gonna make you feel better, that feel healthier. Movement is a good thing because it just makes you feel better and, and, and helps your overall health. Not something is a tool to help you lose weight. And I think that's the key there. And that's the problem with using exercise and, and portraying exercise that often is in our society as a weight loss remedy. Yeah, I hope you don't mind me reading this one, one little excerpt from your book and it's about exercise. And it was in the part um, titled warding off weight gain. And it says, through extra, though exercise is typically, typically an ineffective way to lose weight, it may help with an even bigger challenge, preventing lost weight from returning. Um, so for me, like I said, it helped me just to keep that focus on, I'm not just doing this so I can try and burn maximum calories because that's, I still struggle with that thought. I'm a child of the eighties. That's what we were told, you know, Jane Fonda workout, let's burn calories. Uh, but just to do it, like I said, when I rode my bike yesterday, when I finished, I was like, wow, I hadn't ridden five miles and I don't know how long and I felt good. Like I went about my day, my muscles didn't hurt. I was like, this is great. I just feel good from doing it. It wasn't about, okay, how many calories did my, my phone say I burned on whatever app, you know, that, cause I use my app to track my miles, but it tells you how many calories you're supposed to burn too. But it's just this thing of, I'm just happy to be able to move, you know, especially like I say, after I was diagnosed with lupus, the fact that I can do the things I do, I am so happy. And that's why I do encourage people just, you know, it, when they feel like they need to get started, they're like, well, I can't run very far. Like, well, can you walk for 20 minutes? You know, just get started with something. It doesn't have to be uh, something that's supposedly the maximum calorie burn when you do that. It's such an important point. And, I, and, and the thing that's important there is that you're right, the, the section you quoted from my book, exercise is important when it comes to actually keeping weight off as opposed to helping you lose weight in the first place. But the key there is you don't need to do vigorous exercise to do that. The same kind of exercise that's recommended for good health, that is to say 30 minutes a day of just moderate intense exercise, riding a bike, going for a walk, things that are just moving your body. And those kind, that kind of movement is, is not only great for your health, but also can be very effective for keeping weight off. So I think this idea that you need to push harder, do more, you know, uh, work till you puke, whatever it is that that's necessary when it comes to weight management is just, it's just not realistic and counterproductive. And so I think that it's, as you say, people need to think, and, and I don't even like the word exercise I use it, but I think movement is a better yeah. word because it's just moving your body, moving your body, whatever way feels good to you and whatever it, it, you're capable of, whatever is possible for you. I think that's how people need to think of physical activity. And, 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 and that's going to yield the greatest results for you because it means you can do it. You can sustain that and keep doing it on a regular basis. Yeah, I think I like that. Um, let me ask you about what is the health halo, health halo when it comes to foods that we think are healthy? Because, you know, certain foods are healthier, supposedly, than other foods. So what's the health halo effect? Well, you know, I, I, I like to say it's one of the greatest marketing tricks ever. We see these words that are on these buzzwords on foods that are, you know, um, that are light or natural or gluten free yeah. or um, organic is another one. And yeah. so often people will see these kinds of words and think, oh, well, that's a healthier food or that's a more weight friendly food and they'll, and they'll buy it. When in fact, um, that's not true. There was a, actually a, 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 some research I cite in the book where mall shoppers were shown pairs of food. So a pair of yogurts, a pair of sort of cookies and uh, chips. And they were asked, and so one in each pair was labeled organic and one did not have that label. And they were asked to estimate the calories. And guess what? When people were asked to do this, they always estimated that the organic version had fewer calories than the regular version. Yeah. And even though it didn't, they had the same calories, and they were actually the same foods. But the point there is what it was underscoring is that that's where our brains work. And the marketers know this. So they 
you know, they use this to their maximum advantage to make us buy the organic Oreos or whatever it is that food that's often junk food, but they label it in a way to make us think it's going to be healthier and more weight friendly. And so I think that's something that we need to be very aware of when we're choosing foods is not to fall for this, uh, these kinds of health halos that marketers use to make us believe that certain foods that otherwise we would say, well, maybe I shouldn't get that because that's not so great to believe that it's better for us or okay. And also I would say to spend more money often on these foods because often they cost more money um, to believe that those are gonna be better simply because they have these buzzwords on them. Yeah, um, a few years ago, I listened to a podcast and this guy was like, do you know they sell organic Pop-Tarts? I'm like, what's that supposed to be better for you than a regular Pop-Tart? Right. And I was telling one of my friends about that because she, she's like, oh, I gotta have my Pop-Tarts. I was like, well, if you eat those organic ones, you know, like we were just right. joking, but. But it was just kind of cute, like you said. The and I, now when I go to the stores, I'll actually just look at the boxes to see what the latest buzzword is. Sometimes because sugar free is one I think they still use. Of course, gluten. I remember when the whole gluten free craze. And when I started looking into it, I thought, well, some of these products have the same amount amount of calories or more because of the type of flours that they're using than uh, than the regular stuff. So I'm like, you're not. I don't think you're coming out ahead that much. But some people were thinking that, oh, it must have less calories because it's gluten-free or no, usually it had more um, because of the type of flowers they use. But, you know, I try to re really hard to not fall into the marketing trap, even on TV when they show me, um, you know, certain foods, like fast food, it's like, man, that's a nice, that hamburger looks really great. I think I'm ready to go buy one right now. <laughs> It's very effective, you know, and, but as you say, I think it's, it takes more work, but the key is looking at that nutrition label and, you know, and just in comparing and that sometimes will take a, a, a few extra, a minute or two extra, but to look at that nutrition facts label and, and look at the sugar, look at the calories, look at whatever, you know, and to compare to make sure that the product you're getting, whatever, if it, 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 instead of looking at the front of the box um, with that, with those buzzwords on it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about on my podcast, somebody actually wrote me and said, Gwen, I'm glad you talk about the mental part of uh, things with this is uh, unrealistic weight expectations. I, I remember when I was younger, when I was in college many years ago, um, I always thought getting to that magic number was going to make life great. You know, I reached the number, the heavens didn't open up, nobody, you know, was there to sing saying like, oh, you did it. And it was like the next minute I was like, now what? I mean, I still feel lousy. You know, I, I, I mean, my, I felt I looked better, but on the inside, I didn't feel any better because I thought that certain number was going to take care of, you know, everything in my life. And I still even see that today because you have these charts that say if you're a certain height, you're supposed to be a certain weight. Um, and even my doctor told me, he said, Gwen, don't, don't look at that chart. He's not, he didn't tell me like not to try and lose weight, but he said, uh, some people aren't made to be those certain numbers. And I said, I already know that, you know, I'd already been through that, but I still see people that are struggling with those weight expectations. Um, you know, like for some people, 200 might, they might think, oh, that's too much. But for somebody, 200 pounds might be perfect for them, even though it's not in one, the 100 range. And I think you talked about that in your book about the, the expectations of weight loss. Can you share with our listeners a little bit about what you shared in your book about that? Sure, and this is maybe the toughest thing of all because it is so pervasive in our society that we have these expectations thrust upon us, whether it's from media images, magazine covers, social media, which has exacerbated that problem. Yeah. Um, uh, as you suggested, I mean, family members, you talked about your sister being thin and he's like, oh, well, I want to look like her. So you look at another person around you and say, well, she is at this weight or, uh, she lost 50 pounds. Or I want to do that too. Or it could be your own personal experience. You know, I want to get down to my lowest weight ever. I want to get down to my, the, what I weighed in college. I want to get down to the weight uh, when, when I was 18, whatever it is. Yeah. And so I, there are all these things that influence what we should weigh. And then as you mentioned, there's also BMI, these charts, uh, the body mass index. And that's a real problem too, because body mass index, we could spend the whole time just talking <laughs> about the problems with that. But just very briefly, I mean, that's just based on two factors, height and weight. It doesn't take into account gender or age or race or ethnicity. It was a, it was a scale that was developed in the 1800s, not to assess individuals, but to just sort of look at the averages, to look at averages in population of white men. And so that has somehow become the standard that's used to judge all people in terms of what they should weigh. It's just grossly, and it doesn't take into account how much muscle 
you have. And so there are all kinds of things that are wrong with it. Yet that is some people are told, well, look, if you don't fall into the right zone on BMI, then you've got to, you know, change your weight. So, so, so all those things can influence what we think we're supposed to weigh. But, but I like to say it needs to be really, people need to focus on several things. Number one is on their health, on metabolic health. How's your blood sugar? How's your cholesterol? Um, uh, things like that, blood sugar, cholesterol, and then uh, metabolic markers. And then also, um, what is a weight that's sustainable for you in which you're not yo-yoing up and down that yeah. you can maintain over the long term? That's number two. And then number three, how do you feel? Do you feel good? Do you feel that you can do the things you want to do in life? Do you feel good on the inside? Do you feel, uh, do you have a sense of uh, a sense of wellness about yourself, a good sense of wellness about yourself? And so I think those are three factors that ought to determine what the right weight is for each of us. And it's going to be different. What's what's right for one person is not going to be right necessarily for another person. And it's going to vary throughout your life. You know, it, it, what was right when someone is 22 is going to be different than what's right for them maybe when they're 62. And so, um, and it's going to change throughout your life. But the point is, I just think, uh, and I know it's very hard, but ideally to tune out a lot or try to tune out a lot of these other factors that are really noise uh, and to focus on those things when people are deciding what they should weigh. And I think in the end, it's going to be more likely to lead to good health because that weight is sustainable and people aren't going up and down in weight and also a greater sense of emotional well-being because they're at a, at a weight where they feel good and they feel good in terms of their health and emotional well-being. Yes, one of the things that I wish they had when I was a kid, we didn't, of course, we didn't have social media when I was a child, but I've been able to find more people that either look like me, you know, ethnic wise or body type wise, um, you know, like they're very, they, they do things that I can't even do and they're either the same size or maybe bigger than I am. And I'm not saying that, you know, because they're bigger, it makes it any more um, like heroic, but it's just nice to see people, you can find someone that looks like you or that's on the same, you know, wavelength you're on and to be your motivation or, or they can talk about things that maybe, uh, you know, like somebody maybe a certain size don't understand. One of the things I've talked about even is the clothes you wear to exercise. If you're a certain size, you need certain types of compression clothing to, you know, keep things from jiggling all over the place when you're jumping, if you're jumping around. Uh, so like today, you know, that's one of the things this one lady I talked that I follow, she talks about, here's a brand where they make clothes to help you if you want to be more active at a certain size. Uh, just things like that, that people don't think about. You know, they tell someone that's maybe larger, you need to get active, but when they get active, they're uncomfortable because of either the clothing or they're just not, you know, they don't have the right type of shoes for maybe what they need and the type of exercises they need to do. So there's just a lot to it, but I think social media in some ways has helped as we can find more people to get the information that we need. It's out there. It's easier to get now, I think. No, that's an excellent point. Absolutely. So, well, Robert, it's been great having you on the podcast today. Everything we covered, it's, it's still making, you know, turning the wheels in my brain. But before we leave, I always, always, always like to have the guests to share, you know, tell us the title of your book, uh, where they can find you on social media, you know, how they can reach out to you. And also, you know, can you leave some words of encouragement for our listeners too? Sure. Well, they can find me. Uh, the name of the book again is Supersize Lies. Uh, they can find out more about the book and about me at what my website, with it, which is healthyskeptic.com, healthyskeptic.com. And also find it, I have some uh, short videos, a number of short videos I've produced on some of the topics. We've talked about other topics around nutrition and fitness and wellness um, that I invite people to watch if they're interested. Um, they can follow me on social media, Robert Davis Healthy Skeptic on Facebook and on Instagram at Healthy Skept, S-K-E-P-T. Um, so that's where, uh, that's, so, so those are my, all of my uh, uh, places to be found on social media. Um, in terms of words of wisdom, I would just say, um, you know, the best I can say in terms of just try to tune out the noise. And there's just, as I say, so much noise. It's noise around, do this, do that, follow these rules. And so, and a lot of the, a lot of the advice is so complicated. You got to follow these rules and do all these things. And, 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 and it's not sustainable over the long term. So I think that it's important for people to keep it simple. Keep it simple in the sense of focus on a healthy diet because what's good for your health, the kind of diet, plant-based diet generally, 
um, that's good for your health is going to be good for your weight over time. And that's a diet that can be tailored to what foods you like and don't like. And it's not complicated. It doesn't involve following a bunch of rules and to keep it simple there. And likewise, keep it simple in thinking about, as we just discussed, um, what's right for you and, and, to, and to focus on how you feel, focus on your health and focus on uh, getting in a way that's going to be sustainable for you rather than worrying about all this other stuff that we hear in society about what you should weigh. And I think if people can do that, um, to keep it simple and tune out the noise, I think ultimately they're going to be able to have a greater chance of achieving what's right for them. And again, that's the key in the end is deciding what's right for you and not being led to believe that what's right for someone uh, you know or someone on social media or some other fact or some other place is you've got a, some standard that's imposed on you as something uh, you have to uh, adhere to. And I think that perhaps is the most important point is figuring out uh, what's right for you and, um, and, and doing that and then taking necessary steps to get to there. Well, thank you again. And those are great words of wisdom to leave us with. Thank you, Gwen.